family dreams of prosperity in a foreign land. We're gonna make you a millionaire. But a love of adventure. You like a bit of danger. Depends what you mean by adventure. Smuggling. <laughs> Heroin. Might cost a man his business. We did our best. In this game, Jack, that just isn't good enough. His loved ones. You sort of thought about your family before you decided to play with the big boys. Even his life. All we want out of this is a future. So if it's all the same to you, we'd quite like to be alive at the end of it, all right? The Nightmare Begins in The Bite, Saturday, August the 24th on BBC One. His name is Dick Tracy. Up against the meanest hoods. I want Dick Tracy dead! And the baddest Danes. You don't know if you want to hit me or kiss me. Madonna. Dustin Hoffman, Al Pacino, and Warren Beatty as the comic book hero. You are guilty of attempting to bribe an officer of the law. The Oscar-winning Dick Tracy, Tuesday, 10.15, on BBC One. There's film drama tonight on BBC One, the multi-Oscar-winning Terms of Endearment, starring Jack Nicholson and Shirley MacLaine with Deborah Winger, in 40 minutes. And taking us there, Michael Parkinson remembers interviewing Shirley MacLaine and Lauren Bacall in the 1970s. Now I have a chance to give vent to all my fantasies, you know. Why are you swallowing so hard? <laughs> my mouth's going dry. I'm entitled to a life of my own. And I'm going to have it, damn it, in spite of you, Michael Parkinson. <laughs> Tonight we feature Shirley MacLaine and Lauren Bacall, two great Hollywood stars who are as feisty as they are glamorous and as provocative as they are talented. What they are not is fluffy. First, Shirley MacLaine. When I looked at these two interviews that you're about to see now, I discovered why I developed those nervous afflictions like pulling my hair and rubbing my nose. Shirley MacLaine was an expert at wrong-footing the interviewer, as you'll see. The first interview took place in 1971, the very year the Parkinson show started. Shirley MacLaine, welcome. Can I, can I throw a, a quote at you from, uh, from your book, um, Shirley, which interested me? <clears throat> the joy of being an actress is that you have the opportunity to explore so many facets of life. I mean, I'm thinking now, I'm leading into the area of the um, Ladoos thing. Yeah, you want to hear about the hookers. I'd love to hear about that, yeah. Because <laughs> you did, in fact, you went and lived with them, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Tell us. Well, I didn't live with them, you know, because, I mean, their action's a little different from mine. <laughs> I mean, they get paid for it, you know. <laughs> it was interesting, that really was, because I got to know one of the girls very well, and um, she had a boy, a little boy, she didn't know by whom. Very Catholic, it was really funny, because they insisted if I was going to play the part well, I had to observe the action meticulously, you see. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to do research, you're going to do research. Right. So yeah. they held me down for a minute or two, and then I decided I'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible. That's a depressing experience, isn't it? Oh, my God, I nearly gave up acting. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> for a better alternative. Uh, what, what, was, what was the overriding thing was how proud she was of her profession. Really? Yeah, very. She really thought she was... Uh, she really thought also that she dealt with... Uh, the dregs of humanity where other people wouldn't have anything to do with them, you know. Yes. They're, they're two dollar hookers down there. Yeah. And, um, and she felt that, uh, that she was providing uh, a compassionate service. Mm. You know, a lot of her customers just came to talk. They didn't mm. come to do anything else. It was quite sweet in some ways. But she was very open and honest and uh, made them feel uh, important. Yes. Shirley, yes. what's the... I often wanted to ask a, a superstar this. We've not had many on our program. Um, not to talk about hookers. Not before. to talk about hookers, no. <laughs> uh, one or two of them might have used them, but I <laughs> you can talk about them. Did you... Uh, <laughs> What else? Uh, what? I'd like to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> You're free. You're free. Have you ever interviewed anybody who clammed up? 
No, not yet. There's always a first time, I suppose. What are the disadvantages, though, Shelley, do you think of being a, uh, an internationally famous star? Because you're the kind of person who runs away from it, aren't you? From being a star? Oh, yes, from the, from the acclaim. Oh, no, I, I really don't mind that. I don't get a great large charge out of it either, because I think the invasion of privacy is difficult to handle sometimes. I do love anonymity. I really do love to go to a market and melt into the shopping bags. But is it possible? Sure. Oh, listen, those stars who tell you that uh, they go to buy a loaf of bread and they're surrounded by millions of zealots are the ones who've spent uh, three hours putting on lashes and leopard underwear. <laughs> <laughs> me alone, that's crap, you know. <laughs> I did an experiment once with, uh, with a, a man who was doing this cover story or something, he wanted to know that, and I said, let's try this. It was in New York, Fifth Avenue, and I had on a suit and just little heels like that, and uh, my hair was like it used to be in that pixie style. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I look like the road company Susan Hayward this way, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we did this thing where I said, okay, for ten blocks, I'm going to walk as though I'm a star. Okay, so I walked that way for ten blocks, and it was murder. I mean, the leopard underwear ladies were right. Yeah. <laughs> then, at something like 56th Street, I said, now, just watch the change in attitude, if I can sh swiftly make this transition in time. And I started becoming interested in the shoes and the windows and the sizes of the dresses and the color combinations and other people. Yes. Not one person noticed me. Have you, on the other hand, though, have you ever been guilty of using the fact that you are an internationally known star to your advantage? Have you ever come... Yes, I make your show better. <laughs> that question again. Those of you who haven't got colour television, I'm right pink now. Real? <laughs> there Damn. you go. I mean, we see people who write people who write in and say, is it a wig? No, they'll say, we've always wondered, now we know. <laughs> if they're men, I always write back and say, you're allowed one free pull. Oh, my God, on and what? If you, and if, if <laughs> That story had a good punchline, but we're not going to follow yours. <laughs> what shall we talk about now, Shirley MacLaine? About what job you're going to have tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> the band think you're hilarious. <laughs> They've been hearing the same old stuff for so long. <laughs> Well, we got another five minutes. Is that all we've got? <laughs> what shall we talk about on here, then? We've talked about America. No, we haven't. I'll tell you what I'd like to ask you. You've been over here um, for some time now. What, um, what are your feelings about this country, about the mood of this country? How does it differ from America, do you think? Because we always think we've got this special relationship with America, don't we? And I reckon that we're, we are more foreign to the Americans than, than Zulus oh, are. Oh, boy. That's very true. I'm doing a series here. For Sir Lou Gray, I'm interested in television now. I really think television is something else, mm. you know? Mm. Look at Maybe not after tonight, but, you know, <laughs> up to now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the thing that struck me in working with the, the British crews, I've made a lot of pictures here, but never for, uh, like, nine months and very intimately involved. And just because you speak the same language doesn't mean you have the same thoughts. Yeah. Very, very profoundly, it hit me. Yes. Because the, the assistant director will come to me and he'll say, um, would you like a rehearsal? And I'll say, no, I'm, I'm all right. I, I know the lines. Just to tell him to just go ahead and call me when you're ready. He goes back down to the director and says, she won't come. Nobody, you're ready. She won't come. Comes back up to me. You want, would, you, would you like a rehearsal? I said, I told you. You know, why are you coming and asking me again? Do you mean the director wants me there for rehearsals? Ah, now I'll come. I get down and he says, where were you? 
that sort of thing. Is, yeah. is, uh, yeah. You're always, people write about you as uh, being a sort of sexy and attractive woman. Um, who do you think is the sexiest man in the world? <laughs> Apart from me. <laughs> You're making a joke out of something I said <laughs> offhandedly last week. I told him I thought Cho and Lai was the sexiest man. Cho and Lai. <laughs> Seventy-three-year-old communist. He's worried about. <laughs> Part two of how to flirt with and flummox a talk show host came in 1975. This time in glorious Technicolor. Different hairstyle, same old Shirley, and how. You know, we should explain why you're doing that. You explain. <laughs> <laughs> because the last time she was on my program, I had a button missing on my shirt, and she poked her forefinger into my belly button <laughs> as I was trying to talk about the Nixon administration. Needless to say, it did more for me than it did the Nixon administration. <laughs> it's the no. best poke you had all year, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> all right, enough of that. Now. He walked over to me early, and he said... Uh, why does this always happen? I get a nosebleed. I said, whenever you come near me, you get a nosebleed. That's right. It's the altitude. I'm, I mentioned, in fact, that... Uh, <laughs> I mentioned... Okay. What's my I name? just wondered where your finger had been. <laughs> you know, one of those kinds of interviews, I mean, You're very disconcerting, Shirley McLean. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. Deliberately so. No. No, just you are normally provocative. Just your regular middle-class girl. <laughs> I find that very hard to believe. Indeed, I do. D did you always want to be a film star? I mean, was that your ambition? Oh, as a no. Kid? No? Mm -mm. I'm, I, I never really cared about being famous or being recognized anyway. All I wanted to do was uh, express well, what, what myself. What does bull mean? I mean? It means that. It means when you are in a conformist environment, you feel you have to bust your scenes. That, it's another way of saying I wanted to express myself, whether it was in dancing, which is what I did originally, and then in musical comedy, and then I got more specific with acting, and then in writing, and then finally, I think, in, the, in, in political uh, and social concern. It's all part of the same thing, if you study a yes. person's life like mine. One is not really inconsistent with the other. But nonetheless, for all this, you, w you were a star. Uh, you are a star, and you allow yourself, no doubt, and I know because it's in your book, to be pampered and treated like some sort of shampooed poodle. I mean, I mean, tell tell them what it was like to be a star when 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 you. Well, were my there. makeup man used to have to knock me down and tackle me to put the makeup on. <laughs> I didn't like being pampered, really. But what was it like, though, the system at the time? I mean, what was the setup like? The star, what being a star yeah. mean? Well, you were expected to. Uh, to lie back and enjoy it, I suppose. But that's part of the seduction. That's part of the uh, of the exercise of uh, believing your own myth, which is, you know, crap. Do you find it that problem, the problem of being the the artist in Hollywood, um, the one you just specified, all the more difficult because you were a woman, in the sense that um, you know Hollywood's run by men. In the main, the directors in Hollywood are men. Yeah. It's really interesting now, Michael, what's going on. The parts for women don't exist. You mm. might have noticed. Robert Redford's playing all our parts. <laughs> 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 He's prettier than a lot of us, too, that's, so I don't regret him that. But I, <laughs> I started to figure that out the other day. I was walking on the beach in Malibu, and I thought, what on earth is really going on here? And then I remembered... Then in the old days, the old days meaning the 40s and the 50s, when the Hayes office was the censorship board, and you had Barbara Stanwyck and Joan Crawford and uh, Catherine Hepburn playing women judges, women politicians, women mayors, women scientists, blah, blah. You were not allowed to play a love scene in the bedroom with a double bed 
had to be two twin beds, even if the couple was married, and regardless of what the scene was, one of the people had to have one foot on the floor. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what, I could never figure out what difference that made, could you? You could figure out something to do with that, that'd be really kinky. That's but... right. <laughs> so what happened was, since they couldn't play any real good sexy love scenes, they had to resort to giving women these parts that were sensational in real life. The Hayes office was abolished in the name of more liberal sexual attitudes, and the rating system came in. Well, now, because men were running the studios, men were writing the scripts, and men were the directors, they put us back in the bedroom. And we haven't been judges or politicians or mayors since. We've been screwing out in the bedroom for the last <laughs> We can't get out of the bedroom. <laughs> Why are you crying? It sounds a great life. <laughs> I don't know what you're bothered about. I mean, I'd stay in Hollywood forever if that was the case. <laughs> but, no, I, I, I take your point. Um, but... This, I mean, you that all this is part of what, what you're saying is part of another part of you, which is the, the as I said in my introduction, the, the um, uh, activist in the women's liberation movement. I do hate that thing, women's liberation. It's such I a know. cliche now, isn't it? I mean, well, it's human it, liberation. I mean, all we're asking for is a part of the action, mm. like half. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder, you see, if it's ever possible for it to work that way. Um, you made a, a documentary film about China, uh, but th that was very interesting um, because you approached it from the point of view mm -hmm. of a woman who was particularly fascinated, not in the entire revolution, but in the particular revolution mm -hmm. in China that made women the equal of men. Do you think it works in that society? Well, compared to what they had pre-revolutionary China, absolutely, where the women were less than animals. Really, I mean, you know, the stories of... Confucius said women and slaves are bothersome. Yes. It's one reason why the yeah. anti-Confucian movement has some validity, in my opinion. Yeah, but can I put a quote to you in the book, which seems to me... B before I say it, would you say that I was a, a, a sh male chauvinist pig? <laughs> i tell you what. I'll tell you what. <laughs> You've had great experience at doing this. How do you ascertain you don't want me to answer that question? Oh, I do, yes, please. <laughs> First of all, off the top of your head. Off the top of my head? How about the bottom of my shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a great flirt. <laughs> I love it, too, by the way. <laughs> you know? But I mean... But well, I mean... that's important, because a lot of male chauvinist pigs don't like to flirt. Oh. So I think the flirting part of it eases the pain of the fact that you are a male chauvinist. You think <laughs> Well, all I can say, I can commend you on your, on your accuracy. On my truthfulness. Your truthfulness, because my wife, I've been married 16 years, she says the same as you do. Mind you, she doesn't even say I'm a flirt. But anyway, <laughs> but it seems to me, let's go back to the... Because she shows your buttons on, doesn't she? Yeah, that's right. Not very well at times. And we pop them off. That's right. But there's, there's one... <laughs> I won't get serious if you don't want to be. You couldn't talk like this in China ever, I'll tell you that. No, that's true. <laughs> That's something else we might talk about. But there's one thing, actually, that, that struck me in, in your book um, that, in a sense, for me, sums up the entire lunacy of total equality. Mm -hmm. You make the point, you say, you're talking about the role of women in China. You say there are no women sitting on the central committee of the uh, Communist Executive there. Women were not receiving equal pay for equal work on the communes. The Chinese, now this is the point, Chinese worker peasant is paid according to a system of work points which are allocated on the basis of physical strength and productivity. Since women were usually not as physically strong as men and took time off because of menstrual periods, their work points were lower. Well, precisely. Mm -hmm. No wonder you're a male chauvinist pig so easily. <laughs> what do you mean precisely? Well, I mean, so, I mean, you can never have total equality because women are biologically, physically different to men. <laughs> I can think of a lot of things during my period that I can do that you can't. <laughs> like what? Like not go to war. Oh, that's not an answer, and you know it's not. Sure it is. No, no. Sure it is, because the maternal instinct, which is part and parcel of this time off every month, is the recognition that life is more important than conflict. 
it seems to me that women's equality is to be able to do a project with a man. And when certain controversies um, crop up about how to best achieve a result, you can argue and plan without sexual overtones, because they really don't have anything to do with that's, achieving a solution. That's very boring. I mean, that... No, but that, you're a male chauvinist. No, I'm not. I'm a human being who, who, who if I see something, uh, who, who has an attraction to, to other human, to, to women. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I see a woman who I, do I think is attractive, I, of course, because I mean, it's not a question of conditioning, it's a question of human nature, isn't it? No, no, no. Oh, oh, of oh, course my. it is. Well, talk to a Chinese who doesn't feel that way, and he's got human nature, Well, that's, too. that's what I found terribly chilling about the film, you see, because, I mean, you interviewed a couple of people there, a couple of women, and you asked them what was the first thing they looked for in a man, and they said political consciousness. Yes, but well, you know Jesus Christ, I mean, what, what, what's that? <laughs> That's the first thing Jesus Christ would tell you to look for. <laughs> I no, mean, but, Jesus Christ was one see, of the, the, the first new revolutionaries who was saying everyone should have a right. political feeling about getting along together. But let me define what political ideology means in Chinese. Political ideology to a Chinese, and it's important to understand this, means um, how kind you are to your fellow man, how sensitive you are, how understanding you are, how you interrelate. Are you a nice person, is what political ideology means. But I mean, do you see a Chinaman over there that you fancy? I do. <laughs> he was very businesslike. <laughs> what does that mean, very businesslike? <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously not getting... No? <laughs> if I get into it, I'll blow my whole future. <laughs> Not a bad thing to blow either. Oh, my God. <laughs> Must have been very good for international relations anyway, I suppose. International relations. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of several other kinds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole Asian attitude towards sex is just plain different than ours. Uh, like, how is it different? I lived for eight years in Japan, right? Mm. I don't know what the Japanese think of when they think of, uh, of making love. Really, I couldn't figure it out. I don't know what the Cambodians think of or, or what the Southeast Asian Vietnamese think of. I, I know what the English think of. Oh, brother. <laughs> and, and I know what the French and the German and the Spanish, because we're Caucasian. And we have this, uh, this sort of Western civilization overlay attitude about it. So it's not so hard and we're romantically inclined, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, in most Asian languages, they don't even have a word for love. So that's not the communist's fault. <laughs> no. It really does. Uh, it really does make you reflect on things that you never did think about before. That, for example, I thought, well, now Michael's going to say something about the children being programmed, the people being programmed, and I'm sitting back there on the de on the steps with your warmer upper, and he's saying to all these people here, one, two, three, everybody clap. <laughs> If I saw that in a Chinese TV studio, I'd think, uh-huh, they're all programmed. <laughs> you're going to write a novel, aren't you? Or you're at present writing a novel? What's it about? You. <laughs> I can't talk about it. It's very, uh... You see, everything else I've written, I've been restricted by the truth. Now I have a chance to give vent to all my fantasies, you know. Why are yeah. you swallowing so hard? <laughs> <laughs> my mouth goes dry. You can't <laughs> wait to read it. Sure. Go on. How long is it going to take you to write it, Shirley? Ooh, maybe as long as it, I don't know. Really? <laughs> I suppose I have to finish it by morning, or you're going to be in mortal pain all night. <laughs> Perhaps the loom might make it into a series. <laughs> it, that one would work. And if it is, if it is... <laughs> And if it is really sexy, perhaps I could audition for the role of You won't have to audition. Man. I know just sure? exactly which part you could play. Well, <laughs> <laughs> You can see Shirley MacLaine immediately after this programme in the film Terms of Endearment, in which she stars alongside Jack Nicholson and Deborah Winger. Now, Lauren McCall is not so much a film star as a movie icon. The film she made with her husband, Humphrey Bogart, earned her a special place in the history of motion pictures. Like McLean, she's a strong-minded individual, 
the interviewer takes her on at his peril, as I first discovered in 1972. Sigh, well, sigh of relief. Well. Well what? It's my first time on British television. Is it really? What do I do now, yeah. It's your, it's your, no, it's not quite to actually. You did a... No. It's, it's the first talk programme problem on British television, but... First live. First live. Because you did yeah. a, a programme some years ago about politics, about American election, I remember, for uh, Granada. Did I? Yes. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I think so. Oh. Did I? It, it if you say so, Michael. <laughs> Do you, do you oh, like me? Do you like being interviewed? Uh, it depends upon the questions you ask. Oh, that's evading this, you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, do you, do you get nervous by be sitting there and people sort of probing and asking you questions? Thinking? You mean on television yes. or as opposed <clears throat> to newspapers? No, in television. I just always feel that my life's not that fascinating. I mean, I just think that enough of it is known by now and that it's uh, not that interesting. And unless someone has some extraordinary thing that they can think of to ask, <laughs> that it's just not going to um, keep anybody awake. Yeah, so it's sort of future rather than past that you prefer to talk about. I would say so, yes. as that's the reason then I'm that's in That's the London. message I yes. got, yes. Did you get that message? I got the message. Oh, I'm glad you, you did, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the future then. How did you, um, okay. you you're here to do applause. Yes. How did you, you get the part, first of all? I think my agent was, was uh, approached about it to ask if I would be interested in being in it. And uh, clearly he asked me, and clearly I said, of course I would be interested to be in it. Not having worked for two years, I would be interested to be in anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a part and a story that I, I always was interested in. Hmm. And <laughs> the longer I lived, understood better. Does it sort of uh, bother, bother you when you look at the movie industry and you see that the criteria, particularly for actresses, is simply whether they're beautiful or not? Is it? D well, it certainly is. I mean, I mean, how many... No wonder I failed. <laughs> Um, I don't know. You see, I don't think that lasts very long. That lasts only as long as your face lasts. And your face doesn't last very long. <laughs> Mine doesn't. I mean, a lot of people's don't. I don't think that's anything to base anything on. I mean, then you better save your money, I figure. If, if, I mean, if it's all based on anything that is that superficial. But, I mean, wasn't it a superficial business? And isn't it a superficial business? I mean... You well, were, no, I think, I, mean, I, think, I think in some areas it was. With some people it was, but not with all. I mean, the greatest stars, I mean, the real, real movie stars, that's what we're speaking of, yes, correct? Yes, yes. Are people who really could act. And those are the people who lasted. And as far as I'm concerned, a movie star is not a movie star, unless he can last. I mean, to be a movie star for a year and a half is not being a movie star. I mean, just because your name is over the title doesn't mean a bloody thing. That's true. And the... Well, it doesn't. <laughs> I like your style. <laughs> I think you're marvelous. <laughs> I mean, Cagney wouldn't, wouldn't have been Cagney. Spencer Tracy wouldn't have been Spencer Tracy. Katie Hepburn wouldn't be Katie Hepburn. Unless they had a lot more than just looks or than just communication with the camera. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. And, th I mean, those people are my... That's my idea of stardom. I don't consider the rest of it stardom. Yes. But, I mean, you, you had this uh, fairly abrasive career with Hollywood, didn't you? I mean, you... I would say, yeah. yes, a bit. I started off so big at the age of 19, totally unequipped for it. No experience. Talent totally undirected. So, I mean, I didn't know really what I was doing at all in a medium that was totally strange to me and unprotected. It was stardom overnight, and then I dare you to live up to it. <laughs> well, I couldn't live up to it, you know, so it was as fast as I went up, that's how fast I fell down, and spent really the rest of my career just trying to kind of get to some middle ground where I could function, because yes. it was... Uh, yes, yes. I know... Um, and you I, look so serious. Uh, well, no, 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 I was, I'm listening. I'm listening to you. I'm, I, was, I, was, I was interested. I know, I know <laughs> that you don't like, like talking about... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I know that you don't like talking about, uh, about Humphrey Bogart, and uh, there are very good reasons which I, I respect, but could I just ask you a couple of questions? What was that butt you just threw in there? <laughs> um, because you said there that they were unprotected in, in Hollywood. Um, 
But in, in, in effect, I mean, you were protected by... We were talking about great stars, and you missed him out there, and for, for obvious reasons, you did. But he was a great star. Oh, no question. Because no he, question. Was a, he was a very good actor, too. Indeed. Uh, but what, that stage trend. How, how difficult was it uh, for you, Laura, and afterwards to, to live down the thing of just being Bovey's widow? Is that a very difficult thing to do? Well, it's still going on, isn't it? No, no, it's not. Not, not as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Are you no, sure? So. I'm <laughs> absolutely sure, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll move off the subject in, really in a moment, but I just wondered just how difficult it was, because obviously it was, I mean, and still is, because you've got this, this cult thing about, about him. Well, I mean, I think that's wonderful. That, he deserved that. Yes. Uh, uh, anyone that was that extraordinary, that gifted as an actor, uh, in addition to being as gifted as he was as a human being, which was really above and beyond what most people ever are in their lives or that you ever meet in your lifetime. He deserved, I mean, he rates every, every cult that there can possibly be from every generation, and he's timeless. I mean, I think this will go on forever, long after my life is over. Mm. Um, but as far as my relationship <coughs> with him is concerned, that was our own. Mm. And that, uh, I'm, I just think it's very boring of the press to continually talk about that. I mean, I did say once, and I'll say it again, hopefully for the last time, that being a widow is not a profession. No. And that you live your life the best you can, and uh, when a certain section of your life is over, you deal with it as best you can, and that's very private. Mm. And then you have to press on and do something else for yourself, because you're the only one that's left. So I am entitled to a life of my own. And I'm going to have it, damn it, in spite of you, Michael Parkinson. <laughs> Obviously, though, applause has been tremendously um, important oh. to you, hasn't it? Huh? Well, because I mean, just in the area that we were just talking about, I mean, it is, it is a show that gave me uh, a place in the theatre. The other extraordinary thing about it, too, is that you, you went into this, which must have been the most energetic phase of your career, the touring and the, on, uh, with it and on the eight shows a week. At, a, at an age when, when most women would not be con contemplating... <laughs> um, God. Uh, uh, but I mean... Oh, doctor. <laughs> yes. Oh, what age? Yes, tell me. Where's the but, wheelchair? Uh, <laughs> it's, we're all through, folks. There's no more to say. Good God. At an age when what? Well, all right, let me re... No, no, when How old are you? 37, would you believe? 73, I thought. <laughs> Did you bring this audience with you? No, but I'm going to take them with I me. I should hope so, yeah. <laughs> you got the first three rows of the opening night of applause. <laughs> well, all right, put it another way. I wish you would. <laughs> the French would have it. The French, I don't know which moment, the French <laughs> would have it. Careful. That a woman's life begins, a woman finds herself when she's 40. Would you think that was correct? I haven't reached that age yet, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously not getting very far on this one, am I? Yeah? Not in that department. No, I'm not. not. All right, okay. <laughs> I tell you, what, what else, I mean, what, um, are you, uh, or do you have any views on uh, the difference between uh, American no men? Views no views on anything, all right. Well, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but have you ever thought about the difference between American men and European men, for instance? I mean, are there discernible... I certainly have thought about it, You've yes. About it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you reached any conclusions? Well, you just find me a good man anywhere in the world, and it doesn't matter where he comes from. Really? Yes, there aren't many. No, I wouldn't know about that. There, I would. <laughs> I'll take your there just are not it. many. They're just, uh, I don't know what's happened to the world. There are not, there are not many men that are grown up and that are decisive and that are daring at all. I mean, with their own lives. It's very strange. I don't know whether the war, the war, I suppose, had a great deal to do with it. Yes. With the lack of them. Yes. It's fascinating, that. Are you... Uh, Isn't it? Well, it is, absolutely. It's more fascinating for you than it is for me, I are can you tell you. Are yeah. you... Um, well, that, that follows it. I mean, do, have, you, have you contemplated um, marriage, remarry? Not recently. Not recently. 
But are you going to, do you think? I mean, is it something that you, you like to Well, I have again? to be asked first, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> but supposing that you were asked and he was this decisive, courageous fellow that you were... I mean, what I'm getting at is, is do, do you feel the need for, for marriage? Because, I mean, a lot of people increasingly, more and more people in the world today, f feel that, you know, marriage... It isn't, is, it isn't necessary. Well, I would say in some ways it is not necessary. But I think if you've lived your whole life, as I have, believing that it is, you know, kind of a way of life, I, I, I don't know. I would like to believe that I would not think it necessary, and I don't know, really know whether I would. Hmm. Uh, it's... Uh, I just think that relationships have to move in some direction. I don't think they can stand still. Tell me, do, do, um, after um, applause, or when you get applause underway in, in, in this country, what's your uh, sort of ambition after that, Lauren? Do, do you have any, any plans for the future, about future work at all? Work? No. 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 no? My plan, <laughs> and I do not plan my life anymore, but my plan is to sleep for a year. <laughs> That is my, my aim is to do nothing. I only beg for time, that's all. Yes. I just want the time to take a walk, to wake up when I want to, to go and have a drink when I want to, to not live by the clock, which the theater is a great deal. Yes, yes. that's a splendid yeah. ambition. Would you nonetheless- I may never fulfill it though. Yeah, I know, <laughs> it's my favorite part, you two to go to sleep for a year. But would you uh, perhaps could do it together? But um, <laughs> if- you may all leave. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. The next time we met was in 1979 when she'd written her autobiography and she was a little bit more forthcoming about her career. She was, however, far from being a pushover. She shared the billing with union leader Jimmy Reed and Billy Connolly. Did, did you understand a word that those two were saying? I adore them. I only wish I could sound like them. You do? Yes. In the book, the, the most fascinating um, chapters, and the best written, in my view, are the ones which recount your Careful. relationship no, with, with, with Bogey. How difficult did he find it to live with the, with the screen image that he had of being the tough man, the hard man? There's nothing you can do to erase an image. Once you have made a hit in a role, in a certain kind of role in films, um, there is no way to lose that identity. I mean, people just see you.